Hello everyone and welcome to the Society of Editors Conference 2020. My name is Sarah Brown and I head up news partnerships for Facebook in Northern Europe. Sadly, I won't be seeing you in person this year because of the extraordinary circumstances over the past few months, but it's been incredibly inspiring to see the amazing work that publishers all across the UK have been doing to ensure that despite everything going on, you've been connecting people to the stories that matter most to them. This has been incredibly inspiring to see and Facebook hopes to continue working with all of you in the future to make sure those stories are being connected with the people who need them most. Thank you so much again for all your fantastic work and looking forward to all the sessions today. Hello everybody. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Nigel Railton and I'm the CEO of Camelot UK and have been since 2017. In the uh, current challenging circumstances, I'm so glad that Society of Editors annual conference is able to go ahead, albeit I suppose in a very different and imitative way. Um, we're now in our 26th year of operating the National Lottery and Camelot has supported Society of Editors for 19 of those 26 years. Thanks to your and your journalist invaluable support over that time, a number of things have been able to happen. National Lottery winners have been able to share their good news. Missing ticket holders have been united with their winnings and a huge range of good cause and charity projects have been able to highlight the difference that they make thanks to vital National Lottery funding. And the 30 million that's raised each and every week by National Lottery players has never been more crucial than it is right now. Earlier in the year, the National Lottery distributors announced that 600 million in funding was going towards COVID relief. Now that's the biggest financial contribution outside of central government. And we're continuing to work with them and others to do as much as we possibly can on this long road to recovery. We remain fully committed to keeping the National Lottery up and running and in particular supporting our 44,000 retail partners who have been vital in that to the National Lottery's success since 1994. And I must say they've done an amazing job, I'm sure you'll agree, through this uh, lockdown period and indeed through the whole Covid experience. We of course have a shared interest in that regard as well as many of our retailers and news agents so sell both our products and yours. I know that things are uncertain right now and for, for, many, for many of us, and I know it's something that's been said over and over, but we at Camelot are fully committed to supporting the Society of Editors and the UK media more generally. And we really are all in this together. If there's anything I or my team can do, or you've had any feedback on how we could work better together, then please do not hesitate to get in touch with me. Anyway, thank you for allowing me to say a few words and I'll let you get on with your session now. Thank you for all that you're doing and I hope that you and your family stay safe and well and hopefully uh, in the not too distant future I'll be able to see you again in person. Until that time, thank you very much. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for, for joining me today. It's Ian Murray, Executive Director of the Society of Editors, uh, for this, uh, the second of our keynote discussions that are part of our, the Society of Editors Virtual Conference 2020. We very much would have hoped that this time of the year, we'd be meeting all of you in person at our annual conference, the must attend event of the media world, but for all the reasons we know that that's been impossible to actually do. So the decision was taken to make this a, uh, a virtual event, and instead of trying to get people to actually watch a whole day's worth of screen, uh, we decided to deconstruct it over a number of things. The highlight of though, uh, the, the virtual conference, though, are our keynote discussions rather than keynote addresses, and I'm delighted that joining me today is Lord Burnett, Lord Chief Justice. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for giving up uh, so much of your valuable time, and I'm Really sorry that we're not able to um, introduce you to our members in person at our conference. Hopefully next year, if you'll, you'll join us, you'll join us there. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and, and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, I, I started my career over 40 years ago as a trainee reporter and as everyone in those days, local newspaper, I'm sure it was the same as me, I cut my teeth on spending morning after morning sat in the local magistrate's court, uh, learning my craft in that way, and uh, fully appreciate the absolute important role that uh, I believe that the media and the, and the uh, plays with the judiciary in, in 
promoting open justice. So I'm coming at this from the angle of, of all those years of heritage, of history, of understanding that important role. But I wonder, sir, how you saw that now, particularly in the light of what's gone on over the last six or seven months. Well, as I think you know, I, I am a keen supporter and enthusiast for open justice. And I've long thought that the presence, not only of public, but also of the press in court hearings, and not only high profile and controversial court hearings, is important for maintaining the integrity of the system and also public confidence in the system. I think the reality is that local newspapers in particular uh, no longer have the resources to send reporters to local magistrates courts or local crown courts in the way you describe you started 40 years ago. There are some uh, and I wish there were more. It's undoubtedly the case that the events of the last seven months now, uh, since March uh, 2020, when uh, COVID engulfed the nation, uh, have made the physical attendance of everybody in our courts more difficult. Uh, it's interesting to look back what is only seven months, we're recording this at the end of October, and see how the landscape has changed. Um, in February, at the end of February, I had uh, my annual press conference and all sorts of topics were covered. And at the end of the press conference, someone threw in a question about COVID and whether we were ready for it. And I referred to a, a, a flu pandemic program that uh, existed at the time. Well, I think all of us learned very quickly within the following two or three weeks that such preparations as any organization had thought it had made um, were not uh, up to dealing with what then happened. Uh, even before lockdown, uh, I sent a message to all courts in England and Wales, encouraging the use of technology where it was in the interests of justice to do so, uh, to reduce footfall in our courts. And then everybody will remember the lockdown in the last week of March. In all our jurisdictions, work continued. It seemed to me vital that we should keep going to the whatever extent possible, rather than stop in the hope of starting again. The reality, I think, is that if one stops and then tries to start again, it's much more difficult than reducing and then working up capacity again. But in all jurisdictions, we kept going. We had to pause trials in the magistrate's court for a short time, not the other work, and also in the Crown Court for what turned out to be less than two months. But the re reaction of everybody involved in the system in all jurisdictions was really quite, quite remarkable. Um, there were uh, knocks and hiccups along the, the way, and I don't underestimate the difficulties that many people face, judges, staff, lawyers, and, and litigants. But um, things kept going to an extent which was um, visibly more than any comparable jurisdiction. Now, of course, it also had an impact on the ability of uh, those in the press to follow what was going on in, in our courts. Um, most of the courts actually remained open, um, but the uh, ability to travel to them uh, and the willingness to travel to them, frankly, was diminished. And so there was a, a fall off in um, re reporting of the more ordinary and routine cases. By contrast, because we were able to step up uh, the use of uh, remote hearings, particularly using online platforms of the sort we're using now, and there were many cases, including some very high profile cases, where it was possible for the press to attend remotely and watch what was going on. And the result was that there was very much more press interest um, than there could have been were we restricted to the physical courtroom. In, in, the, in the circumstances where more is being done using the telephone and using online platforms, um, it, it's obviously important that we and HMCTS think hard about open justice and enabling those who wish to attend to do so. Uh, and that is what's going on at the moment. 
And the context of it is as simple as this, that you'll know that even before COVID, there was a long-standing program to develop better uh, online and video technology for the courts. And detailed work has been going on for a number of years on how to sustain uh, open justice in that context. But we've moved forward very quickly in the last seven months. Thank you for that overview. And um, I think from, from the from the media industry's point of view, uh, uh, they have welcomed and I'll be very grateful for the steps that were taken to enable access well, as much as possible. I think there have been one or two questions, and I want you to put them on the spot with regards to jury trials um, and, and not having the ability there to, to dial in. Um, and, and wondered whether, you know, going forward, that's going to, going to be possible. I think the... Um, uh, the Secretary of State for Justice in his Mansion House speech was saying that sort of that was then, this is now, um, and we're not likely to go back in that way. And I agree with you that the early part of the year, the discussion was still about around video booths being set up perhaps in courts and was that workable. And now the discussion within the, the media industry is, look, this has worked so well so far with remote access. Can we not just continue on with that? Do, do you have any thoughts on that? The way I've been putting it, um, I think repeatedly and probably uh, ad nauseam for some, is to say that we've taken three steps forward during the last seven months because we've had to, and we will probably take one step back. In, in, in respect of everything that's been going on during COVID, um, we are constantly learning uh, about what works and what doesn't work and what the difficulties and pitfalls are of some things that are being done at the moment. But I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident that um, there will be uh, developments, but they need to be thought through really very carefully. I mean, one, one of the things um, that everybody is uh, conscious of is that if one has um, extensive remote access to hearings, then the judge is not in a very good position to control what people are doing and what they're capable of doing with what they're seeing. And there have been uh, glitches, shall I say, where um, contrary to the rules, um, recordings have been made and they've been circulated. And that's something that we have to be very, very careful with. Uh, would it be a matter, I'm just, Floating this, that would it be a matter though that that's a simple matter of bringing it in, a, a, you know, laws against that and, and penalizing heavily someone that breaks those rules? Um, but the, yes, rarely is anything quite as simple as as one is one as one thinks. And um, as I say, we're we're constantly learning lessons. But you'll remember that um, one of the developments that uh, the COVID has uh, enabled, and in, in some contexts there have been regulations to uh, support it, um, is for vid fully video hearings, which are effectively live streamed. And that happened in one or two cases in the High Court, for example. And I think that's going to be looked at with, with great care to see the extent to which it's a good idea to keep that going or not. And one comes back to um, a sort of central feature of this, that um, the involvement of the press, the limited uh, broadcasting and recording of proceedings that we have at the moment um, is, is designed to inform, to improve proper reporting of what's going on. I always remind myself that legal proceedings are not and never should be entertainment. They're also, proceedings in which many of the participants are uh, under an enormous amount of strain and pressure. And so the uh, recording and broadcasting, different concepts, but nonetheless, the two go very closely together, of um, witness evidence, for example, is, is something that I've always been very cautious of, um, because I'm conscious of the pressure that witnesses are under irrespective of what proceedings they're engaged in. Well, of course, that's been a lot of the, the discussion that's taken place earlier with, with regard to cameras in courts, um, which um, obviously I don't want to, to, to preempt what, what the 
my broadcast colleagues would actually say about this, but it, it, it's almost being overtaken by the, the live streaming debate with it. That. And it, the, the argument was that we don't want to end up like some of the American states where we had a bit of sh showboating going on. Um, mm. And, and we, we see that there. And it's, I, think, I take what you say about it. It's informative, not, not entertainment in, in that sense. Do you think that the cameras in courts will now progress a, a, a lot faster than the very cautious small steps mm. that were being taken? I, I'm not sure is is my absolutely honest answer, and I give you my absolutely honest answer. Um, live streaming has been a great success uh, at the appellate level. So uh, we live streamed the Court of Appeal Civil Division, and the Court of Appeal Criminal Division is capable of being recorded for broadcast. There are often sensitivities about the identity of victims and anonymity and things of that sort um, but, but at the appellate level that has been a considerable um, success in that it has uh, opened up uh, the access of the public uh, through the availability of such uh, media uh, to what's going on in the courts and I think that's a very good idea. Um, the, there is discussion uh, about whether similar arrangements might be made in judicial review claims, where by and large, almost always there's no question of witnesses and they're much more like appellate proceedings because they are supposed to be concerned with points of law um, principally. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's something which uh, I, I'm thinking about with others uh, and have some sympathy with. Um, criminal proceedings are different criminal proceedings in the Crown Court. And I mean, you'll remember, and all of those involved in the project will remember that um, I have been a great supporter of the possibility of broadcasting sentencing remarks. Mm -hmm. And from the point of view of, of, of your world, uh, I, I can well imagine that the stately process that it, it was, was, was followed to get that into law may have been quite frustrating. But nonetheless, we did get it into law and the relevant uh, um, delegated legislation was laid before Parliament. Um, it, it, it too has been interrupted by COVID because at, at the moment, the, the practical arrangements for getting cameras into courts uh, with all the COVID restrictions of social distancing and footfall through the buildings is, 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 is are, are rather difficult, but I'm I'm keen that that should, as soon as possible, uh, produce some dividends in the sense of we will have some sentencing remarks recorded and uh, broadcast, and I think it'll be important to see how how that goes. That sort of neatly moves us on to um, a, a point I was going to raise uh, with regarding to you know how the, how the public perceives them through the media, the, the judiciary, and 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 there I say I won't say quite often, but from time to time, the the media will pick up about a, a sentence that that a court has handed down, um, and angry relatives will say we, we thought this person should have it's got off too lightly or, or whatever. Um, do you feel, therefore, that, that the, the broadcasting, the filming of those sentences, in, in other words, in the total that's there, will, will actually explain more to the public about the thinking behind what, what the judge, uh, what the conclusions that they, they've come to? Well, I, I think there are two, there are two points um, um, buried in that question, really. The, the, um, the, the first is uh, concerned with the... Um, personal interests of some of those closely involved in criminal proceedings. And we, you know, one should never forget that criminal prosecutions are brought in the public interest. It's a public process and following conviction sentence is a uh, public interest matter following fairly tight rules. It's no surprise um, that those who have been the victims of crime will often feel that whatever sentence is handed down um, is inadequate. 
but it's important that one recognizes that that sentences are not handed down for the purpose of satisfying any particular individuals or interest groups. But on the question of um, uh, explanation, uh, yes, that's why I think it's so important that sentencing remarks are capable of being uh, recorded and, where appropriate, uh, broadcast. Uh, judges have a, an obligation, a legal obligation, to explain why um, they are imposing the sentence uh, they are. Um, they do so often in high profile and controversial cases, the judge will uh, reduce uh, the reasons to writing in advance and make them available um, to the press, but they're quite dense often. And uh, what I'm hoping will happen in some high profile cases um, is that the reasons will be uh, condensed and explained in a way which enables the central reasoning um, to be broadcast if the judgment of the broadcasters is made that it's uh, it, it's worth doing, but it also will help the the, the print reporting and the online reporting of um, why a particular sentence has been imposed. It's all about making it easier for people to understand and thus to um, improve through understanding public confidence. Do you, do you believe in general that the, uh, the media is, is fair to, to, to judges and, and uh, so under, understand their role fully and portrays it in that way or, or is that is not so fair at times? Well, it, in general, yes. I, I, I think the, the media um, reporting of court proceedings is generally uh, fair and balanced, objective. Inevitably, in all our minds, it's the unfair ones that are likely to stick uh, a little bit more. Um, and so there, there are two or three little things that, are, that, that always slightly grate with me um, when I read uh, news reports or hear news reports. Um, one is, um, X was spared jail. Um, which, which suggests that the writer uh, has a default position of everybody should go to jail for everything. And, and yet the, uh, the statutory position, I mean, Parliament has said in terms that nobody should go to prison unless all other options are not suitable. So that one always, always slightly grates with me. The other one, if I may say so, um, is um, a general inability of many in the press world to understand the difference between privacy and secrecy. I see. Do you want to embellish on that at all? Well, um, quite often there are uh, reports that something has been kept secret when all, all that's happened is that something is judged private. So, I mean, to give a, a simple non-legal example, uh, everyone's medical records are private. They're not secret, they're private. There's a difference. And um, there needs to be a recognition that when dealing with particularly the personal problems of individuals, uh, there can be a good reason why full details of uh, underlying facts uh, can't be put into the public domain. It is a matter of, of, of I can suggest it of public trust, isn't it? And public trust in the judicial system and public trust in my profession as well, in, in the media. And, and do you feel that the, the, the public's trust in the judicial system is, is where it should be? And can the media do anything to assist with that if it isn't? Well, all of the um, uh, sort of national opinion surveys that are taken from time to time of the rel relative standing of uh, different professions in society um, places uh, judges very near the top. Um, uh, not 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 um, not as trusted as I think as nurses and doctors, but trusted more than uh, most other professionals. You, you can be, say journalists who are I, we're we're usually we were usually holding up everyone such as our strength. It would be invidious of me to identify some of those. 
um, uh, 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 at the bottom. And, and it's still the case that when there's a big problem that needs solving in this country, um, people turn to judges. And whenever there's a need for an inquiry, people turn to judges. Uh, and, and so I think there is um, uh, still, despite I think a general erosion in respect in society, um, a, a, a general high regard for the judiciary and what they do or so the surveys tell us, and I've no reason to suppose that that's wrong. I think one of the problems is that uh, not very many people until they engage with various parts of the judicial system, appreciate just how, how broad it is. Um, and I, I fairly often, as often as I can, uh, visit uh, schools and talk to, to usually kids who are doing GCSEs or first year doing A-levels, that, that sort of cohort, and um, often ask them, well, what's their perception of judges? And so they, they, always, they always start by saying they think we wear wigs all the time, whereas, as you know, wigs are only worn in some of the criminal courts for some of the time. Um, they focus almost exclusively on crime because that, of course, is what gets written about most in the press, it's what gets talked about most on social media, it's what gets um, broadcast most in, um, in, in, in broadcast media. And very few people have a clear idea of the uh, breadth of the civil courts, of the family courts, or of the various tribunals um, that, that operate to sustain the rule of law until they come in contact with them. Yes. And so I, I, I've long thought that there is a, there is a general um, uh, lack of understanding about the, the breadth of the legal system, the role of judges, the importance of the rule of law. And we've been trying through, through uh, programs uh, that we operate by the judicial office and in cooperation with other bodies to uh, engage with schools in particular to try to improve that understanding. At, at the end of your talks, uh, do you do a straw poll to see how many of the youngsters actually would like to become a judge? I don't do a straw poll because I think it's um, it's quite it, it, it's quite a bold thing for any for any teenager um, to say, "Oh, I'd like to be a judge." Uh, what I what what we're doing, and I do these when I can, but many other judges do them. We we we've, we've 125 or 130 community and um, diversity relations judges who go into schools all the time on hold at the moment for reasons you understand but but who go into schools all the time and, and our our aim is to demystify the law to some extent we want to encourage bright kids um, from from all backgrounds to contemplate the law or uh, careers around the law as, as part of what they might um, pursue. And if we get increased interest in the law, then in due course, we'll have a stronger pool for the judiciary. And about part of the media I put forward, media's role is, is obviously to inform the public, as you say, that the judicial system is working, that it's there, there's not a, there's not a silence in a vacuum that, that takes place. So citizens can see that there is justice taking place. Um, they've no need to take it into their own hands, for instance, or feel the helpless that's there. And also, of course, you know, in the same way that we're under scrutiny, is to, is to scrutinize the, uh, the system itself and ensure and, and, and be sure it's there. I just wonder, I mean, it's been mooted that as we move forward with this brave new world, that, that perhaps we'll have a world of online pleas. Um, let's talk about proposed abol abolition of committal hearings, um, those kind of things. Do you think that that is going to remove too much scrutiny or that the, the public wouldn't be very confident about that, that, that that's going too far? Well, on, on, online pleas um, uh, are already happening for um, sort of very routine, if I can call them that, uh, offences in, 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 in the magistrate's court. Um, the fact that there have been please, um, it becomes public. But what, what's quite interesting about it 
um, is that when people are able to engage using technology, the rates of engagement go up. It, it, it may not be a surprise for, for me to say that if summonses are just sent out in the post and uh, land on doorsteps, um, the, the percentage of people who ignore them, take no action at all, is enormous. That those who can um, respond online, the percentage of engagement goes up. Now, it comes back, I think, this, this question of yours to, to some uh, open justice issues, which do need firmly to be in everybody's mind. I mean, for example, the television licenses, I appreciate that they're controversial for all sorts of uh, reasons at the moment, which, which I certainly shan't comment on. Um, but the, the number of people prosecuted for failure to have a, a television license at the moment, I haven't got the precise figure in my head, but it's, I believe, well over 100,000 people a year. Now, um, th this, is, this is high volume um, justice. Uh, almost all of them are guilty pleas. They're dealt with in a, in a very summary way. Um, but speaking for myself, it remains um, a, a, a matter of some importance that, for example, um, a newspaper editor or a judge or a politician um, failed to purchase a license and was prosecuted for it. And so there have to be mechanisms um, to enable that still to, to happen. Although realistically, how anyone is going to trawl through the thousands um, of names looking out for one that might be familiar is, is a matter for your members rather than for me, but the principle um, is an important one. And the same is, is, is happening with um, what, what might be regarded as low level um, motoring offences, for example, where uh, similarly it's possible to, as it was always possible to plead guilty in writing by post, now it's possible to do it uh, online in some circumstances. And that w I think that will expand and it will make the system uh, much more efficient. Uh, and also it will improve um, engagement, which I think is important. And, and staying with the, the, the digital world and online, as you were saying, and, um, I wonder what your, your thoughts on, um, on social media. Um, and I'm thinking about it from the point of view of, of the established media, the mainstream media, as it is now referred to, um, is quite rightfully we're regulated, self-regulation. There are there are laws um, uh, about contempt, um, and yet we know that the huge numbers of people, of course, are, are talking to each other all the time on social media. Um, usually with no knowledge of, of the laws of, of contempt or, or defamation or, or others of the laws of the land. Um, and when it comes to covering courts or just reporting things, can be making all kinds of claims. And I wonder if that more of a threat to, to the system than the, now, than the established media? Well, I, 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 I should say that I don't see the established media as a threat to the system. At no, 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 thank you. I will trust your words by me. I will get picked up on that. Thank you. Yes, well, I, I just I, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't picked up on it. <laughs> um, but I mean, social media is a, really a remarkable phenomenon, um, which is developing on on not quite a daily basis, but even comparing social media today with social media a year ago and two years ago, it's on the move all the time. And um, trying to keep up with it, uh, the regulators, the law, obviously presents um, re real difficulties. And I don't think there's any, any, any getting away from that. Um, before coming directly to the question you asked me, I think uh, I, I would make an observation about uh, social media. And it's that far too much attention is paid to what's going on in social media. Um, it's usually unwise in life to take much notice of those who shout loudest. And my perception is that social media provides uh, a forum for very shouty people often to make a lot of noise. And uh, I actually regret um, that it's 
it seems to me that people use social media actually to manipulate the ordinary media, because if you shout a lot in social media, it gets picked up in the ordinary media and thus can dictate debate of all sorts. So I think there's the, the part of the answer to the so, to social media problem um, is possibly to take less notice of it. But that said, um, obviously, um, there is a scope in social media um, very casually and quickly uh, for people to do things which, if they were uh, writing them in newspapers, would get them into very big trouble. Um, an, an awful lot of it isn't noticed. In other words, the, the, the circulation of, of what's said is, is, is very small. Um, but there have been um, a, a number of quite well-known incidents where contempt proceedings have been brought against people um, who've used social media. Um, and also there have been a number now of quite well-known uh, defamation actions brought against people who have said things on social media. And so um, those who use social media um, shouldn't think that they are immune from the ordinary laws of the land. Um, does, it, does it pose a, a threat? It, it, it's possible. Um, uh, particularly in the context, I think, of uh, high profile criminal cases, uh, it's at least possible um, that uh, expansive uh, adverse comment on social media uh, might cause difficulties with the trial. I'm not aware of its having done so yet, although others may, may have instances in mind um, but we have to live with it we all have to live with it and um, I, I don't see any uh, easy solution to containing uh, what's on social media uh, so long as we're in an environment where those who provide the platforms uh, are not themselves responsible for content now, I know that that is a, a deeply, deeply controversial area, and I emphasize I'm expressing no, no views on it, um, but we, we have to live with the system as it is at the moment. Do you think a little bit more, um, I'll use the word education, would help perhaps. You mentioned about going into schools, but something there about schools and explaining. I, I know that schools do try and uh, assist with children to show them the dangers, uh, yeah. of, of online, but also um, I'm amazed by the number of adults that I talk to who've got no concept really of what defamation is and certainly not of contempt. Um, and I know that from anecdotal uh, reports from, from journalists who say that, that they go into court um, and then of course they are allowed to tweet live They're on their phones for instance, but members in the public gallery and sometimes they have to go and sit in the public gallery because there isn't enough room on a press bench or there may not even be a press bench unfortunately these days. Um, and then there's, there is friction, possible confrontation between, well he's tweeting over there, he's using social media, she is, and why can't I kind of, or even if they're not even picked up, it's, and it, it seems that they're, uh, uh, as you say, what can be done, but a bit more education. The, the press can mm -hmm. do this for these reasons because they are regulated, they are trained. Yes, and you're not. Well, that's I mean, in 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 the context of a of a court hearing. Um, it is uh, not uncommon uh, for a request to be made by uh, a journalist to um, be allowed to tweet from court. And um, in some cases, that, that can be uh, extremely valuable because it's providing um, really instant commentary uh, to the wider world on, on, on what's going on. And I think I was one of the very first uh, judges who allowed that when I tried a case in Winchester as a High Court judge nearly 10 years ago. Um, it is different with members of the public. Um, because, as you say, um, they are not aware of what 
can be tweeted and what can't. So um, the possibility, uh, either deliberately or inadvertently, of a, an ordinary person in the public gallery, or more likely someone who has an interest in the case, uh, tweeting out or sending out information that could compromise the fairness of the proceedings is something we have to we have to bear in mind. And so I think it most unlikely that there will um, ever be a, a free for all in the sense of anybody who comes in uh, can happily tweet away um, because they don't know the rules or even if they do, some of them are not inclined to follow them. Thank you so much, uh, Robin, for the time that you taken today we're coming to the end of, of, of our session together and I, I wondered if I might just ask and take you back you've mentioned about uh, an awful lot of youngsters when you go into into the schools think that you spend most of your time uh, uh, wearing your wig um, must be disappointed when you turn up and you're not wearing it um, mm. I, I just wondered what your th thoughts were um, do you can you see a time when wigs uh, there will be no more wigs and uh, that it's, it's seen as being too old fashioned and, and we, we need to move forward. I'm not saying that I personally think it's old fashioned, but there, um, or do you think that, that for the dignity of the court, it, it should remain? Well, um, I, I think the starting point is to understand when they're worn. So true it is we wear them for ceremonial occasions. And at this time of year, I, I'm swearing in um, a number of new high court judges and court of appeal judges. And so I put on my full ceremonial robes. Um, so, all right, we wear them ceremonially, but wigs are worn only in the Crown Court and in the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. That's the limit of where wigs are worn. And um, it's interesting that w whenever opinion is canvassed on this, particularly opinion canvassed outside the legal profession, people quite, quite like them. Um, and I think they like them because they lend a dignity and solemnity to the um, proceedings. I, I don't think one should underestimate the, the importance of the nature of criminal proceedings, where the judicial arm of the state um, is determining guilt or innocence and then depriving people of liberty, sometimes for very long periods. And so it's a it's a very solemn thing, and it should never, in my view, be done casually. So uh, that, that's really why it hasn't changed. And for the moment, um, the, the preponderance of view is that it's best left as it is. There's also a very practical element which uh, both lawyers and judges uh, refer to, and that is the anonymizing of participants by the wearing of wigs. And I, I can give a very simple example if I've got one minute to do so. When I was a recorder, so that's a part-time fee-paid judge sitting in the Crown Court for a few weeks a year, um, uh, I sentenced somebody at Snaresbrook Crown Court. And uh, I didn't put him in prison as it happens, um, but I sentenced him. And uh, uh, he and I both travelled on the same tube away from court. He sat opposite me and he didn't have a clue who I was. Now, that's actually quite an important feature for the judges and uh, barristers who uh, appear in court, that it anonymises them. It takes away their personality from the function that they're performing. But more broadly, um, the public seems to like it, and oddly enough, so too do those who are being tried, uh, at least according to some of the, uh, uh, the surveys that were done some, some years ago. So straight answer to your question, will, will, will they never go? Of course, I can't say that. In the short term, I, I think not. Thank you very much. So before I let you go, and thank you once again for all of your time, uh, in these, uh, to conclude these discussions, um, I'm asking uh, my guests a simple question, which is that once we return to whatever normality is and all this passes, what's the one thing that you're, you're looking forward to doing again that, that you've missed the most, perhaps, during the, all, uh, all of the, the restrictions? Seeing people informally, 
casually for meals and drinks. I think uh, from, from my perspective, um, the, it's in a way lovely to be um, spending so much time with my family. Uh, that's a bonus um, with the children at home as well. But um, just not being able to have the usual casual social interactions um, is something I am longing to come to an end. I think that speaks for most of us. So thank you so much for your time, uh, providing it for us, and uh, may I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.